We're going to go get started on kind of building a data lake house today, some of the principles of it, what you need. Again, we are talking about Trino and Iceberg here, all open source tech. Um, essentially, we are going to focus on the principles first, um, and that's why we're using Starburst Galaxy as our Trino instance, just so we can get a workshop environment in. If you have any questions about Trino after, both of us would love to, ask, to answer any questions you have. Um, that's the priority here, uh, but essentially we're going to do it just to get that 45-minute instance in. Um, it's a way to kind of show you, get your hands dirty before jumping in. So. Not your father's data lake house, building with Trino and Apache Iceberg. There's a lot of talk about lake houses these days, lake houses being the new hot tech to utilize. Um, and essentially what we're gonna dive in is build one. We'll build one today and we'll kind of look at it and we'll utilize the modern table format, which is Apache Iceberg with the query engine, the best query engine in the world, if you ask me, which is Trino. And we'll be able to go forward with that. So this is kind of just a little bit of the agenda. We're going to talk about very quickly how we got to the lake house, why it's so popular now today, pick the components, build our data lake, and then of course the hands-on workshop. So I'm going to try and fly through the slides so we can get to the workshop. Um, but again, if there's any questions on anything, the workshop will be available for two weeks and I will put my email in the readme on GitHub. So if you have any questions, just forward them to me. I would be happy to open up the keys for longer. Anything you need um, will totally work with you. So getting started with the data lake house, I like to explain it as Pokemon. So we start with the data warehouse. You know, we have our, our BDMS systems, they evolved into our data lake, and then we get where we are at our data lake house. So just kind of running through the background of how we got to where we're at today, I think it's a little bit of a good setting the stage for why this is where we are, where we're now. So starting with our data warehouse, you know, we had it popularized in the 1990s. It was like the new thing to provide the 360 degree view. Um, and if you ask some banks, they're still doing that today. But essentially providing that 360 degree view for you because each RBDMS was siloed and we weren't able to integrate those specific RBDMS. So that's where the rise of the EDW, the CDW, where we have that, um, but that gets expensive. And I think if anyone's worked on those, you know, you know the querying, you know the issues, even the cloud data warehousing today gets expensive fast. And it's something that we're kind of looking at and evaluating in the data landscape where we're at today. And there's like not a lot of flexibility and scalability, which became a real issue as we move into kind of the 2000s where the internet age and the big data boom, data boom occurred. And you have, you know, finally Apache Hadoop coming to save the day and figure out a little bit of the data lake and being able to access that unstructured data. And also there was a shift towards more of that parallel processing. This didn't really solve all of our problems though, because you also have a lot of that data quality inconsistencies. You have things in the lake where they're hard to find. You know, you can't most importantly support those transactions or those modifications. So you're really limited to what you can even do in the lake already. And that kind of leads to where we're at today within the data lake house. And that's kind of applying those data warehouse-like principles to the data lake, being able to capitalize on the cloud object storage that we have today in your data lake environment, but applying those data warehouse-like capabilities. And so that's where you get the separation of storage and compute really being the hot commodity that you're utilizing today, where you can pick whatever sort of data lake house you want, but being able to separate out the compute engine from the storage and really owning your own data and preventing, preventing any vendor lock-in that might happen. And then you also have that increased performance and scalability concepts because when you apply like a modern table format, which we'll do with Apache Iceberg, with something like Trino, the compute engine that's already built for the speed and scale, you get something a lot better than you would in a data warehouse specifically for those unstructured, semi-structured that you can't do in the other you know, data architecture. And then, like I mentioned, um, tackling that un unstructured, semi-structured, and structured analytical data all in one. And then really what's cool is you're able to integrate both your analytical workflows with sort of your ML data science. And I know people have probably heard, you know, Databricks and Dremio, very similar concepts here that we're going to be building today. We're just focusing it on the Trino and Iceberg side. So that was a quick little overview, and now Jack's going to talk to us more about Trino and Iceberg specifically and why they're awesome. 
Yeah, uh, let me go ahead. I'm gonna. I'm a, you do I'm a click. Okay. Um, I will. I will start. I will start here because I want to reiterate one of the biggest things that we've learned, kind of in the data industry over the past umpty umph years, is this really important concept of separating your storage and your compute. And this is something the data lake did great at, um, but it's something that we feel we can do even better. Um, so we're actually going to focus in on the two components that we believe are great for compute and storage, these two separate layers, the two components of the lake house. And so starting off with compute, we're gonna talk a little bit about Trino. Um, so we're gonna go back to do a little history here. So Trino came around in Facebook at around 2010. Um, Facebook had you know, created Hive to query terabytes of data. Um, they were trying to query these over these massive object stores, but performance was really slow. You know, you have these you know, old Hadoop and Hive processes that were, you know, some like, as it, this anecdote says, fewer than 10 queries a day, um, which is not something that anyone in this room would ever accept shipping out the door to uh, a customer internal or external. Um, so they had this amazing, this really hard problem of you, we you know, don't have our ability to use access our data. So enter Trino, uh, formerly known as Presto. Um, the year in 2012, you can actually see the founders. Um, this is Eric, Dane, David, Martin, and uh, you remember his name? No. Nope. Uh, these guys uh, all work at Starburst, so I know them. That's why I'm, I'm naming them. But um, one of the one of the things they did, they worked on Trino. It's a distributed SQL engine designed to query kind of these really large uh, data sets in a distributed way. Um, one of the th key things to point out here is over one or more heterogeneous data sources. So this was not just your hives, actually. It was your hives, your Postgres's your X, and then it was designed from the ground up as an open source project when they built it in Facebook. So they thought about all the different ways they can connect to more than just what uh, Facebook was using at the time. So this did the most important thing, which is separated your compute from your storage. And it was uh, ANSI SQL compliant, and it still is today. And that's actually something that I think we are really proud of. Um, or at least you know, the Trino community is very, very proud of, as is that we are ANSI SQL compliant. There's no special dialect of SQL that Trino uses. It's SQL, the same SQL everywhere, but over a massive amount of data. So this is actually the architecture, and this is why I'm, I'm brought up to talk about it. Uh, the, these, these lines represent data flow. These lines represent your metadata flows. And so there are two different types of nodes in your Trino cluster. You have your coordinator, which takes your SQL, parses it, optimizes it, schedules it, it gets the metadata from all your different data sources, it creates a plan, it then gives that plan to one to many workers. Um, those workers then take that data, start streaming it in from your sources, and then performing the actual SQL calculation on it. On it. What's really important, I think, to point out here in this diagram is that what's really cool from like a compute engine history perspective is that what, I mean, um, you know, this, is, this is cool to me. Um, the, the results are actually streamed out to you immediately, very quickly. Everything is done in the engine to get those results to you as fast as possible. And so it's an incremental, you're always getting, you're, it's streaming out to you um, as part of the protocol. And what that did is that it may, allowed them to do interactive queries very, very quickly and only use the resources they need until the result set that they needed was returned. And this is, I think, a little bit compared and contrast with your Sparks and your Hadoops, where it was like these big, massive ETL things, whereas Trina was more optimized for these interactive, you know, your select tens, your joins, your max 20s, your, you, you could really get really insane performance over these huge data sets um, because of this protocol and the resource usage that it allows. Um, so now we're going to talk about the actual storage component piece of your, your compute and your storage. And the storage component piece that we particularly like is Iceberg. Um, and so one of the things that we need to compare and contrast against is Hive. Um, Hive itself is amazing in the sense that it, it created an entire new field. And we do not come here, uh, you know, insulting our forebearers. But <laughs> Hive has a number of challenges that made it a really big struggle when it came to using it as a table. So one of the things I really, I think is, is important to like a concept that's really important to like grab on here is that when you had your RDMS, you, you could think of tables as tables. You didn't have to think about how is this being stored on your file system, right? How is this, you know, how, how do I have to worry about schema evolution here? You know, 
alter table, add column, whatever. Like you didn't think about it. Hive, very different. You have these rigid partitions. You are only partial schema evolution. Each partition has its own schema. It wasn't optimized for object storage, and that's not really Hive's fault. It was built in an HDFS age, but now we have S3, and S3 is amazing. We need to build things for S3. Um, and one of the things that Hive really didn't optimize around is that you needed to scan all the files in a folder, which is not something S3 does with tremendous performance. Um, and so one of the th you, you have this problem, and then you have transaction, and transactional and asset has always been squirrely. Um, I actually think these are almost like, if you know what this means, you know that this is going to be true, right? <laughs> um, you know, if you have basically file location-based uh, inclusion of your data into your data table, you're always going to have a really hard time making your data lake transactional, making it asset compliance. And that's where you kind of get Iceberg. Now, Iceberg was created by Ryan Blue and Daniel Weeks at Netflix in 2017, which is really not that long ago. Um, it was to solve kind of these performance challenges around listing, around data for modification, especially the usability for you data practitioners in the room with Skiva evolution in the lake, especially with Hive was just so onerous and he really was not opaque to the user. And so Iceberg focuses on all sort of these open source uh, data concepts and different sort of data file formats. You have your orcs, your parquets, and your avros, and you can store data in all these formats and the metadata themselves are you know, partially stored in those formats. Um, and the, the, the GIF here does a really great job of showing that Iceberg is this one layer that sits on top of your blob storage, and you can use it. It is engine agnostic, and it was designed from the ground up to be engine agnostic, which is really, really useful um, when you want to go about building your lighthouse. And so Iceberg really took the question and said, okay, let's have a data lake, but we actually really want some of these old data warehouse features. We really want to not have to worry about of doing scheme evolution. We really don't want to have to worry about you know, where our files are living and then that being important to the transactionality. It needs to be, you know, you update, the table goes from one state to the other. You do a merge, tables one state to the other, right? You don't have to worry about that. Um, deletes, and then there's even time travel, which is uh, a really amazing feature. And so you basically go from a data lake where you can't treat it like our, you know, a data warehouse table to now being able to treat a data lake like a warehouse table. And that is the genesis of the term lake house. Um, and so I already mentioned some of this, but you, Iceberg should really be invisible to you. You don't have to worry about where things live, no zombie data. If for those of you who have had the privilege of working with Hive, you know, if you drop a column and then re-add it later, uh, data that was deleted is now back, that's zombie data. Um, you don't have to have a meta store for listing where your file locations are, your partition locations are. Um, you are, it's, it's a fully in lake, or sorry, full in object storage metadata format for the most part. Um, it doesn't steal attention, uh, automates the boring stuff, fixes problems, and then optimistic concurrency is the thing I was talking about where you can actually have um, concurrency control on your data lake with uh, you know, different updates, merges, writes, um, obviously, there's performance implications there that we can talk about later, but um, it's, it's pretty, pretty incredible what you can do with just S3 and some software. Um, and so now we're going to get into... Yeah, now we're going to do it. We're gonna, I'm going to run through two quick slides, but it's just going to kind of show what we're building on. The first one is just kind of reinforcing where we're at. Like, in my head, the lake house is like the doodle of data architecture because you can take whatever data warehouse benefits you are, which is the smart, being able to have all the information you have and like your poodles, but then you want, you know, whatever kind of data lake you want, the flavor of cockapoo, you know, you can have like a cocker spaniel, you can do a cavapoo, whatever you want. You can add your, you know, your S3, ALDS, whatever you need for your data lake. You then apply those two together and you get, you know, your lake house as kind of the doodle of data architecture. So I thought very, I had to resist very hard for putting my own doodle on this slide. <laughs> um, okay, so now we're going to build it. This is kind of just what we're going to do and then we're going to do it. So the first components are open file formats and our open, our commodity storage. So we're going to use S3 and our open file format is going to be of choice is Parquet. But really these are the center of gravity of your data lake house. This is what we're going to build everything off of. Then we have our table format of choice, 
which is Iceberg, and what actually enables our data lake house because we're able to do the updates, the deletes, everything will run through in the lab. And then we have our compute engine, which is Trino. We're going to be using Starburst Galaxy in this instance, and that's actually what powers our data lake house. And then the last component is kind of this global federated access. This is kind of where we had the reference of not your father's data lake house, where everything has to be in the data lake house itself to be utilized. This lets you actually access the global federated access to data outside of living in S3 or wherever your data lake house is, because you can actually access data from multiple locations. So in our lab example, we're going to utilize data that lives in S3 and connect it with data that lives in Postgres. So we're gonna be using both at the same time to build our ETL pipeline. And then the last portion is just kind of that security governance and access control layer. And you can do this with any tool that you want. We're gonna be using Starburst just in this instance for the sake of the lab, um, but you can utilize this with you know, your tool of choice. But that's really the components of the data lake house, the open data lake house, which set it apart from what you've been hearing in all of the you know, LinkedIn chatter of what is the data lake house. So with that, I think we are ready to kind of get into the hands-on workshop. I'm going to show really quickly here that this is where you can go and get all of the information. Monty Miller on GitHub, Data Council 24, it's public. Go ahead and follow along with the Data Council lab. The first steps to the Data Council lab are getting set up with Starburst Galaxy. I don't know why I clicked on that one, sorry. I should have clicked on my PDF that I have open. The first steps here, is just kind of getting set up with Starburst Galaxy. So go ahead and go to this free Starburst Galaxy account. And what I'm gonna do is talk about the lab overview while you do that, so that we're not wasting any time. But if you're ready to run the lab with us today, willing, you know, a participant, go ahead and go click on that account and get signed up and then we'll go forward from there. Um, okay, so essentially our lab here is that we are a data engineer at Burst Bank. And Burst Bank has identified a new potential fraudulent scheme that actually is kind of rising in popularity. And we're pretending the date is March 6th, 2024. So that means that we have five days of data in March 5th where we have to go look through and identify these potential fraudulent schemes and figure out if this is true or not. And so we need to basically create an output, an ETL pipeline for our financial crimes team to investigate. And we're gonna do that by discovering the data, building out sort of, it's called a medallion architecture or a reporting structure in our data lake house. And again, it's gonna be the open data lake house because we're building with S3 and with Postgres. And so we're gonna create a data pipeline and curate it in order to get um, all of the information. This is kind of what is loaded in our S3 files right now, just showing you an example of a JSON. It's in JSON format. And what is happening is we have the um, data ingested into S3 by day. So we can look at sort of the example here. It's kind of small. Let me make that bigger. You can see the login date, all of the information here ingested for S3. And from there we are kind of, that's like what our architecture looks like. So if I scroll up here and show you what we're doing, we're gonna be first, you know, the web logon actions coming in in S3, combining it with our, info, our customer information in Postgres and then building our medallion architecture or our reporting structure in S3, building out a final data product. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my cluster warm, get everything ready to go over here in Starverse Galaxy so that I am good to go. I'm gonna just kind of start things up and make it ready to go, but we'll be able to do this together as we go through. So the kind of first steps, um, if you've already created a Galaxy account and gotten logged in, is gonna be just creating those data sources and connecting those data sources. And again, pushing Galaxy here as the quickness for Trino. Um, feel free to ask us any questions about Trino later, but Trino is you know, the query engine to build your open data architecture on. So. We're gonna get started, this kind of sign up process here. I'm gonna pretend like we're through the sign up process. And if you have any questions, just go ahead and, and let me know. But I wanna make sure we, we keep moving with the lab time that we have available. So we're going to start on page eight of the lab. And the first thing we're gonna do is connect to that S3 catalog, which houses all of the web logon actions that we need to then build. Also, S3 is gonna be utilized as our storage layer for our you know, fundamental build of the data lake house. So we're gonna 
do that and start rolling. So I'm just gonna pull up my Starburst Galaxy account and I'm gonna go to the Catalogs tab and I'm just gonna click Create Catalog and the object storage catalog that I want to click on is the Amazon S3 catalog. And here we're gonna add a catalog name, a description, authentication, and then we're gonna make the Metastore configuration information that's available on that page seven of the lab. So I'm just gonna go here and click it, and I'm gonna actually move that tab over so I don't get lost. And what I'm gonna do is just copy all of the information that I have here. Um, it's the web logon actions is what I'm gonna use as the catalog name. You can use whatever you want, but the queries are specified for web logon actions, so don't change that one. The rest of them, <laughs> the rest of them you can kind of change as you need, but that one is gonna be a lot harder if you change that one. Um, and I'm just gonna add a basic description because it's in my blood to put something there as a data engineer and adding the metadata. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna connect with an access key. So I'm just copying over the two keys, um, essentially clicking this radio button that says AWS access key. Putting this information here, and I promise you this is the hardest part of the whole lab is getting this part signed up or set up. And then once you've kind of got your key in there, we're gonna move on to that Metastore configuration. And that's gonna be an S3 bucket, which is in the lab. It's gonna be the Starburst 101 S3 hands-on lab. And then here's where I need to call out for your default directory name. Go ahead and put your name or some unique identifier to you. You'll never see it again. You don't have to remember it. Just put something that's unique to you so that you have all of your queries separated. So I'm gonna do Monica Data Council. It's probably gonna yell at me. I don't know if I can do underscores. Oh, there we go. Um, and then I also wanna click these two buttons that allow creating to external tables and allow writing to external tables. This is gonna be key. We're building that data pipeline for Burst Bank, trying to connect all those data together, update them using Iceberg. So we're gonna need to make sure that both of those are turned on. And then our default table format is going to be Iceberg. So just leave it as it is. And then get here and click that test connection button. Anyone have any questions? Jack is here, he can help run around. <laughs> okay, cool. Sweet, code didn't break. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Jack is our all-star engineer on Galaxy, and so I thought it would be really funny to bring him in here, and if, you know, for some reason, if Galaxy is broken, just be like, well, it's because Jack's here, and not, uh, not live, yeah. so, exactly. <laughs> so we're gonna connect that catalog. Um, just click that button. The set permissions, we're just gonna scroll through it, so we're just gonna save those access controls, not worry about anything else. We're just gonna be an account admin for the day. We'll worry about it later. And the next thing we wanna do is actually add to a cluster. The cluster is gonna power our compute for that catalog, the catalog being the connection to the data source. And luckily for us, we don't have to connect two data sources because we've got the sample data for Postgres already loaded for us. Um, it was just about connecting our S3 so we can read and write. But in order to do that, we need to connect to a cluster. So I'm going to click the free cluster available to us just right along with what we're doing. And I'm going to hit add to cluster. So green button, hooray. Any questions on that? Y'all are a quiet group. You're like, the lab's too hard, we're gonna do it later. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to run schema discovery. And so essentially this is just gonna give us a little bit of a heads up. Um, personally, when I was a data engineer, half my job was actually figuring out where data lived. It wasn't actually doing anything hard. It was just trying to track down the data sources. So. With this, we're gonna use schema discovery for our first layer. So we're kind of emulating the fact that like we've already, we don't know where the data lives in our data lake, but we're gonna give it a URI and just build off of that and then figure out what flows with us. And it's kind of this experimental pipeline mode where we're just gonna run with it, but we don't know all the information. Um, and so what we're gonna do is click the run schema discovery button. And we'll have our URI in our lab if we go to page, ooh, I've just kind of done this by heart. Let's jump ahead to page 13 and you can copy the um, URI. This is the data we're just pulling from as like we're pretending it's getting ingested every single day for us. This is where we look to then build from. So I'm copying the URI on page 13 of the lab and I'm filling that in. And then I'm gonna leave 
the de default, schema, default schema as discovered schema. That will be in the queries too, so don't touch that. And then essentially we're just gonna hit the run discovery button. And this is building out the first layer of our land layer, so also known as the bronze layer in our medallion architecture. This one is just the raw data, completely untouched, ingested into us, like so we can then manipulate it in our structure and consume layer. I'm going to now select the schema that has popped up and the table that's been populated as well, which is the 324 logon actions. So we're gonna click that and then hit create all tables, which is technically one, but you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so now this is doing the information for us and forgive me for cheating here and using schema discovery as opposed to making everyone run one SQL query to pull from the JSON, so it's almost easier to do this than try and get that wrong. But if you have issues with this portion of schema discovery, the appendix has the queries to run to get that table built out for you. So now we have this automatically completed for us where it's created a schema, created the table, and then run a sync partition to make it so that the data is actually populated in that table so that we can see it with our Metastore. I don't know, you might know something more about that. The Galaxy Metastore? Yeah, just the sync partition metadata thing. Uh, yeah, the, we, we have our own implementation of a Hive, a Metastore you that you can then put different tables in, so just it's easier than having to hook up your own Metastore, but it's, it's a detail. For this purpose of the For workshop, purpose, yeah. we're going to only use the, the Galaxy Metastore because it's easier. So here we have our discovery run. So now we're done. Now we've done all the hard clicking and now we can actually get to the Trino and Iceberg portion, get into the nitty gritty, talk about where they, you know, where we're able to do the data, warehouse, data warehousing on the data lake. So we are going to go to, let's see what page I'm at. Page 15 of the lab guide and we're gonna go to the query editor. And now we're gonna start running queries. And if you're in, yeah, go ahead. Second one, right? It's an error? I think it's supposed to be an error. Yeah. I'm forgetting exactly uh, so there. I go back, change my file, reload, that's it, yeah. And then I run it again, and then it's only fine. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's... <laughs> Are you call an engineer on our side, and you have them fix it, and we alter Steve his, his, his name to do his it to your Jordan, work. actually. <laughs> yeah, he's the best. Jordan Zimmerman, yeah. <laughs> Jordan will fix it for you. No, yeah. um, that, that is a great question. I think the there are certain ways in which we do that type of... Uh, you know, inference. So like if you had a column in one JSON and then it wasn't in another, we would actually just like, it's like, now it's an optional column, right? Like that's just like a very normal thing that that's like a more easy to do inference versus your strings versus your ends. So uh, it does depend on your situation, but for the most part, we, we try to do the most sane thing. And if we can't do the most sane thing, we throw there. Yep. Good question. Any other questions I can feel to Jack? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. You can field the Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got this portion done. Like I said, now we're ready to kind of actually start clicking around and building our data lake house. So I'm going to go to that step 15 where we are navigating to this query editor button. And this is kind of where like go forward, think of the Trino iceberg brain. Don't think about the galaxy one anymore. So we're gonna look at the query editor and I am just going to add a new tab here because I don't really wanna mess with the sample data. Um, and essentially this is like my Blake canvas. So we are ready to kind of build our pipeline and we are ready to kind of experiment with Iceberg a little bit and show some of the power that Iceberg has. So we are going to go to that, you know, next page 16. And the first thing I wanna do is just test the schema discovery that we just did. So I'm going to navigate to this little catalog tab and click on the web logon actions thing, just to make it easier for me. This is a shorthand for us to run queries, so it's easier. And we're going to just copy a basic select from page 16, validate that the schema discovery worked. And this will be the same for everyone, the same query. It's just a basic select, limit 10, looking to see if it runs. 
and we're gonna hope. There we go. Look at that. I always get nervous the first one. <laughs> I'm like, oh, please run. <laughs> um, and then we have, so this is kind of what our data looks like if we're just looking at it. Now, we're gonna run a show create table so we can look at the data underneath it, the metadata of it all. And we're going to just kind of look and see what this table looks like because we don't have a lot of information from it. You're just basically blindly hoping and praying from a URI I gave you. So we're gonna run that really quick. And if we see it and we actually kind of look at it, you can see that, uh-oh, it's a hive table. Why did she do that? <laughs> uh-oh. We need to do the conversion and actually show you. This is kind of just replicating that. There's so little you can do with Hive. And we're going to basically change it into a more performant um, Parquet file and Iceberg and basically show you the power here because this is just a JSON with Hive, which is so outdated these days. So now we're going to kind of do that next step. We're going to create a schema for us to place our new tables in. And we want a separate schema because these are going to be where our iceberg tables live. So I'm going to go to lab three on page 16. And this is where we're moving on to our structure layer. So if you've got hopefully positive queries, you'll see that um, we have that hive table. We've built our land layer. The raw data completely unedited. This is what was given to us. We need to then transform it, optimize it going forward. So I am going to basically go forward and create the structure layer and the consume layer. And the structure layer is that enriched data. And the consume layer is that data ready for that final output for our data consumers, whether that be through you know, a BI tool, a data product, whatever. So structure layer on page 17, the first thing we're gonna do is create, a, create that schema. So I'm gonna copy over Right here, I'm gonna go a little faster. If you look at the, or not faster, but I'm gonna skip this step because I already did it. You wanna make sure up here that you have your free cluster selected and then your catalog web logon action selected. That way going forward, we can all run the same queries. And we don't have to do any manipulation. Next thing to do is that copying of, oops, copying of the schema command. So I'm just gonna copy step two Create schema web log, if I can copy. I should just type it at this point. Create schema web log on actions. And then put your name in here. I'm gonna put Monica. Whatever identifier you want. And we've got our schema created. Now I'm gonna click that schema up here so that we can use the shorthand in the lab. So whatever schema you just created, just select that. And we're going to actually just skip validating the schema. I trust all of you. <laughs> and we're going to build that structure layer. So we're gonna actually create the second table for us to then manipulate with Iceberg. So I'm gonna copy on page 18, the structure table, put it in here. And essentially what we're doing here is a structure table, type Iceberg, Parquet format, same partitioning as the date, but we're just doing a select from updating it to the new type. And the reason you can also run an alter table command to get it just from Hive to Iceberg, but I'm doing this on purpose to kind of show the demonstration. Now that you've got your structure table, we're going to just validate that and just with a basic select statement. So select from, and we can see that actually the data looks exactly the same. But what doesn't look the same is the data and the metadata underneath. So we're gonna run another show create table for the structure table and we'll be able to see a difference. So I'm gonna to go to page 19 and run the show create table for that specific structure table. And we'll be able to see that it is iceberg, it is parquet, those are the two main differences for us here. You can also see the location, the format of the version for Iceberg. And now we're able to manipulate a lot more because we're able to build it into that Iceberg table format. Um, okay, so now I have a lot of information here about Iceberg with metadata, how it works. This is kind of just additional reading. We're gonna do all the fun stuff here. And then if you have like any questions about it or something and you are like, oh, what did she mean? 
that's what this is kind of here for. So it's just telling you about kind of the iceberg specs, how snapshots work, you want, and then um, kind of how the data files and the snapshots in iceberg are built, what they're for. Um, and essentially, what all you need to know to run this lab is that the snapshots help you do all of the data manipulation in your Metastore. And it keeps track of it, and it's really awesome. And if you have anything to add, that's this is if you if you don't uh, you know fun. this is this is my fun part, but you know uh, I think for the you can talk to Jack. The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> purposes of actually learning. Come how see to us at the booth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so now we're gonna do the first part where we're manipulating the table that we just built the structure table. We're gonna manipulate it using Iceberg. So we're going to explore some of the unique capabilities it has in the newly created table. Um, specifically, it's got all these extra tables for you to then find out the information. So I'm just going to do a basic select from the partitions and see what help, like what comes back. We should have those same five partitions because we partitioned it um, by day. So I'm going to run that query and see what happens. And yeah. we are able to see that. Go ahead. Yeah, so th this is interesting just because this is actually not querying the data, it's querying like the table metadata. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're abstracting away kind of the table metadata and we're allowing you to access it in SQL, um, which is, you know, one of the one of the fun things. That's all. Get groundbreaking. I, it's, it's nice. I like it. Truly. Really? Like, yeah. You, you can read which files we're reading those out of from, but um, it, it gives you a lot of insight into kind of how your table is structured and the, like if performance considerations are a thing uh, that you get need to need, start getting into. These tables are massively important. Yeah, absolutely. And now what we're going to do is look at the snapshots. So we just looked at the partitions one. We're just going to look at the snapshots. And essentially, that's just like the basic information that it has for you. Uh, and all it's going to have is just the update to our table, like the creation of the table. That's our first snapshot. And now we're going to do two more things, get some more snapshots in there, and then do some time travel with it. And I think that's all we'll have time for, but there's a little bit more in the lab for later. But um, that's more starbursty. It's about security and access for the end of the data lake house. Do that on the end if you want, but let's finish the iceberg portion here. Yeah, and these snapshots are, are your, your key to transactionality. Uh, these are, you know, what your table transactionally um, moves between. And so your table state is always fixed and set for a specific snapshot. And that's what we will actually get to see in query, but the snapshots are cool from the perspective of understanding. They are the key to unlocking the data warehouse behaviors mm -hmm. on your data lake. So now on page 21, we're gonna run a delete, which before was not possible. No, not, yeah, not well. <laughs> <laughs> not well. So we're going to run a delete from without actually writing just the delete from the partition. We're, our um, data analysts have said they only need specific amounts of data. So we're going to just run a basic delete. Um, delete where the login success is true and the login attempts is less than two. So we're just going to run that. And we'll get a deletion of those 4,000 rows. And if we go and actually just kind of run the same thing where we're looking for the structure of the snapshots, we'll see something different. We'll see that second snapshot pop up and we'll be able to see now there's an overwrite. And I have in here why there's an overwrite because to me, I was like, why isn't that a delete? It's something with um, the iceberg default uh, where it's actually an overwrite for deleting files that match an expression instead of a over, it's an overwrite instead of a delete, but that's why. So now we have these two snapshots, and the next thing we're going to do is just run the same delete query and see what happens. And this is just to kind of prove the item potency, because it's important, and be like, oh, this is awesome. Like, we don't have to mess up again and do all the things. But if you run the delete, you'll get the zero rows. And if we actually go into updating the table, which is something in the past that was not well to be done. Didn't, 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 didn't go well all the time, you know. <laughs> so we're going to run an update that is on page 22. And we're just going to, you know, the log on action structure table, we need to set the IP address to one, negative one instead of having it be null. So we're just going to run that update. And then if we run the snapshots again, running on page 22, we'll see that it's different. And that we'll see that third snapshot which is another, oh, 
I run the yeah. wrong query. Yeah. You. Go. Oh, I was querying to prove that it is null yeah. now. So, you know, go <laughs> me. Now let's look at page 23 and run the, um, where's my snapshot? Query? I'll just go it's, up. It's a little bit up, yeah. I'll just go up, yeah. Now we'll have those three. So we have that extra overwrite too. But what if your data analyst was wrong? That happens. So let's do some time travel backwards, which was before scheme evolution not possible at all. Not well. No, no, not well. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to do some time travel and back it up so that we're able to actually view the data in our beloved snapshot too. So I'm going to go to look at specifically page 23, and I'm just going to select... Before we do anything with our time travel, I'm just gonna select from the logon actions using a specific customer key. Let's just narrow our pool down. We're gonna have a lot. And we have two more queries to run and then you're all free to go. It's like class, like Jack said. <laughs> so we have our IP address here. You can see the customer key that's got an issue in the negative one. What we're gonna do is we're gonna run a query to actually go backwards in time and look at where it was null. So I am going to just copy this query and update the query. Instead of utilizing where the one, two, three, four, all of that in my second, I want to replace it with my second snapshot ID. So I'm going to do this and I'm going to cut and paste here and delete. And I'm also going to find my snapshot ID that I want and I'm going to copy it here. So if I copy this number, and then move it down into my query that I copied and run, you'll be able to see that we time traveled and we're back at the IP address. And so the last component of this lab, I'm gonna pause. I know y'all have a lot of sessions to appear to. So I just wanna say thank you so much for coming. The last part, thank you. The last part of the lab is to build your consume layer, which is in the doc. You don't have to finish the lab, but if you wanna just kind of glance through as like, oh, what are we doing next? We're federating our data with one query, and then we're building a consume layer, which is joining that data from Postgres and globally, like we talked about being important. Um, and from there, I think that's pretty much it. It's just kind of showing the data warehouse capabilities on the data lake and why it's important. And um, I think that's, that's it for today. I just want to say thank you. If you have any questions, come, come bother us. <laughs> <laughs>